At the bottom of the ocean, at depth of 4,000 to 5,000 meters, there are resources worth several hundred billion euros. The Peru Basin and the Clarion Clipperton Zone can be named here. In both areas, a so-called polymetallic nodules are found. These rocks contain exactly the metals that are needed for decarbonization, meaning the conversion to renewable energies, namely copper, nickel and magnesium, and rare earths such as neodymium. In principle, these so-called manganese nodules just need to be collected from the seabed and brought to the surface. In this video, we'll take a look at how the process of deep sea mining works and what environmental risks can occur. In addition, of course, we look at two potential stocks. In the conclusion, I share my personal opinion on deep sea mining. I'm a Spenny Stock Pincher and I'm glad you tuned in again. For deep sea mining, different companies have come up with different concepts, but they are all similar in principle. A large crawler is placed on the seabed and connected to a logistics ship. The device then travels over a previously explored area of the sea. This area must meet the conditions for the deployed vehicle, for example, slopes and hollows on the seabed must not be too distinctive. Initially, about 15 cm of the seabed is stirred up, similar to a plow in agriculture. The manganese nodules are sucked up by water pumps and then separated from mud and sediments in a filter system. Due to the lighter weight of the sediments, they do not fall down into the collection basin. The manganese nodules, on the other hand, which are symbolized here as yellow arrows, fall into the collection basin and are then pumped to the surface. In order to generate sufficient negative pressure to transport the boulders to the surface, a pump has to be installed approximately every kilometer. In this way, an incredible 400 tons of rock are to be extracted every hour. Here, for example, you can see a trier of machines developed and already tested by Nautilus Minerals. Two machines plow up the underground, while the third machine transports the manganese nodules to a collecting tank before they are pumped to the surface. Such large machines strongly interfere with the ecosystem. Therefore, in the next chapter, we will look at the environmental impacts and risks of deep sea mining. Deep sea mining could threaten all the flora and fauna living on the seabed. This threat applies not only to the mining area, but also beyond it. The habitat of animals and plants living directly in the mining zone will be completely destroyed. The sediment clouds created by the churning of the seabed can still spread over hundreds of kilometers, depending on the currents, and affect distant life. The mining area is expected to take several decades to completely renaturalize. In addition, it is feared that not only sediments will dissolve during the process, but also carbon dioxide stored in the soil. This would rise to the surface and further accelerate climate change. Anyone who has seen the documentary Seaspiracy will be familiar with this form of CO2 release through bottom churning. There, however, by trawl nets. The water in which the manganese nodules are pumped to the surface still contains sediments. Since a pump must be installed every kilometer to achieve the necessary output, there will be pump water and thus sediment releases at every level of the deep sea. Each level contains different organisms, all of which could be affected to a greater or lesser extent by the sediments. In addition, the noise from the pumps could disrupt marine life, such as well communication. If after this chapter your moral compass has not yet convinced you to refrain from investing in deep sea mining, I now present investment opportunities. There are actually only a handful of players active in deep sea mining, and by my reckoning, only two public companies. The tradable companies are the Metals Company, formerly Deep Green, and Seabed Resources, a subsidiary of Lockheed Martin. So that's the dark green and blue zone drawn in. DEME, Ocean Mineral Singapore and others are private companies. Let's start with the Metals Company, which has a market capitalization of $270 million. To accelerate its IPO, Deep Green has merged through a SPAC, Special Purpose Acquisition Corporation. This shell company is Sustainable Opportunities Acquisition Corporation. So under this name, you can buy Deep Green on the New York Stock Exchange. The stock has been moving relatively horizontally since April 2021. The initial emission price of the share was 10 US dollars and has fallen back to this price after a rise, or is just below it at 9 euros 91. The metals company presents itself as a savior for the environment on the mainland. In this video, the metals company denounces the exploitation and pollution caused by mining on the mainland. 
It points out that underwater resource extraction requires less energy because the manganese nodules are already at high grades on the seabed. Conventional mines on the mainland, for example, require more water and also energy because the grades are lower on average. Of course, the mining equipment is not big and powerful as shown here, but rather very gentle rolling suction robots where hardly any sediments are stirred up. By the way, CEO Gerard Barron is very public spirited. Here, for example, you can see him at Cambridge House International giving a speech on sustainability in mining. If you look at the rest of Deep Green's management team, you see that not only CEO Barron, but also head of project development O'Sullivan, previously worked at Nautilus Minerals. Nautilus, you remember, was the company that developed this lovely drive. But what is much more interesting is that Nautilus is now insolvent. About the insolvency, you can find the following excerpt at Wikipedia. So fraudsters allegedly sent $10 million worth of payments to fake addresses. No investigation report was ever published as to where exactly this money went. Nor did PwC list any discrepancies in Nautilus year-end report. But what's that supposed to mean? EY also found hardly any discrepancies at Wirecard. But that's a different topic. Of course, I don't know what exactly happened at Nautilus and whether Barron and O'Sullivan had anything to do with the disappearance of the money. That does not reaffirm my confidence in the leadership and by extension in Deep Green itself. However, should Deep Green eventually receive not only exploration licenses, but also mining permits, I see huge upside potential for the stock. The second company is UK Seabed Resources, a wholly owned subsidiary of Lockheed Martin. If you want to fill your karma account even faster, you can invest here, because besides deep sea mining, they invest primarily in the defense industry. But at this point, I can reassure, because all products of Lockheed Martin are produced sustainably according to their code of conduct. Tanks and combat helicopters are produced entirely without workplace bullying and in a diverse environment. Seabed Resources is also conducting exploration activities in the Clipperton zone. Because Seabed Resources represents only a fraction of Lockheed Martin's capital, it is not really possible to invest here. That is why Deep Green remains the only pure play in my eyes. Deep sea mining is a very controversial topic, so I will only give my own opinion without referring to any sources. For me, there is no question that we as mankind need a lot of metals to cope with the energy transition. A lack of resources will increase prices and slow down the transition to CO2-free technologies. Mining has always meant an impact on nature and landscape. Large amounts of water are used for processing and chemicals are used to dissolve the metals from the ores. That's just the not-so-popular truth that goes with the energy transition. The deep sea is insanely large and the least explored environment on our planet. That is why I think that deep sea mining should not be categorically excluded. It may be possible under development of demanding environmental standards to lift this treasure from the deep sea, leaving a smaller environmental footprint compared to onshore mining operations. In my opinion, investments from the private sector cannot influence whether a company can push through certain technologies anyway. The real market price is always determined by big investors. At the moment, sustainability funds are also very trendy, for example, climate change ETFs. If a lot of private investors want to do something against climate change, the solar cell manufacturer Jinko Solar or the wind turbine manufacturer Nordex will profit as part of the ETF. Should the price of Jinko Solar now rise and be overvalued, large investors will dump their positions and the market capitalization will again align with the valuation of the company. All that will have changed is the composition of the shareholders. Personally, I'm convinced that the expansion of renewable energies is primarily threatened by the shortage of metals. Projects will fail if resource prices are too high. That this is already the case is shown, for example, by the price increase of copper of over 100% in the last 12 months. Even if it sounds polarizing at first, maybe an investment in deep sea mining is more sustainable in a few years than it seems to be at the moment. Precisely because it's a very controversial topic, I welcome a comment on where you stand on it. I have attached all sources, including the link to the report Deep Trouble by Greenpeace. If you're interested in more exciting topics on mines and other penny stocks, I invite you to subscribe this channel.